Hello, this is Graham Brown, and this is Upschool Book Reviews. Every week, I share insights from a book which will help you become a better entrepreneur. And if you like these reviews, then why not take my free course featuring five reviews of the best business books to sharpen your entrepreneurial skills. For more information, go to upschoolbookreviews.com slash course. Today, I want to share with you my review of Essentialism, The Discipline Pursuit of Less by Greg McKeon. So this book is similar to a number of other books that I've read and books that I recommend if you're interested in the idea of being more productive and maybe being less stressed at work. Then Essentialism really is continuing in that vein. So the other books that I've read, which I think Essentialism is building upon is 8020 and The One Thing by Gary Keller, The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, and The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. So what is this about? Well, it's not new, but I think the subject matter is important enough to warrant another book. It's kind of like a reminder, reminders of what's important. And really, that's what the theme of the book is about as well. So let's sort of start off. I mean, page eight of the book, Greg McKeon talks about the difference between the non-essentialist and the essentialist. So to give you an idea of what each of these types of characters are, the non-essentialist is about all things to all people and the essentialist is about less but better. The non-essentialist engages in the undisciplined pursuit of more and the essentialist engages in the disciplined pursuit of less. And I guess at the end of the day, the outcome is the non-essentialist gets a life that does not satisfy. So I guess that applies to 95% of people out there. And even if you are satisfied, maybe you want to improve things a little bit. So the goal is to move towards the essentialist worldview way of doing things. And that's living a life that really matters. So what does that mean? That means less noise, less stress, less busyness, more time to really engage in the things that matter, whether that be work that makes a difference or spending time with our loved ones. And the key to this book is the idea that we can make a choice about how to spend our energy and time. The difference being between proactive and reactive. Now, this is a theme if you're familiar with The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey talks about the idea of being proactive rather than reactive. You know, there's a space between what happens to us and how we choose to act. Now, most people don't act on that space. They simply react, which makes them a non-essentialist. So whatever happens in their world, whether that be requests to engage in some projects or meetings or answering emails or phone calls. The non-essentialist has to react to everything and that makes them overworked, overstressed and so on. The essentialist, however, decides to be proactive, decides what to act on and what not to act on. And as Greg McKeon says, you know, if you don't prioritize your time someone else will. And that's evidence from the moment you turn on your computer at the start of the day. And I think, and I've seen this with employees that I've had in the past, that I see a lot of people, as soon as they turn on the computer, the first thing they do is check email or check Facebook. And it's kind of like a reaction. It's it's like a knee-jerk reaction. So why do we do that? We do that because it's a ritual. It's a routine. It's like making that cup of coffee in the morning. It has to happen before the day can start. And as innocuous as it seems, what I feel about this ritual is it immediately puts you on the wrong foot for the rest of the day. Because what happens is as soon as you're checking emails, you're now allowing other people to prioritize your day. You're allowing other people to set the agenda. So you're reacting to emails, 
you've got an urgent memo come through, a, con a client email that needs to be answered right here, right now. And then, you know, here's some crisis that's in the making that needs to be dealt with. And Facebook is just as bad. You're on Facebook and you get a message and the next thing you're looking at videos of cats. So the key here is that first five or 10 minutes of the day is really a pivotal moment. It sets the agenda, whether you're going to have a non-essentialist or an essentialist day. And it really changes the course, the direction of the day, maybe not a lot in the next five or 10 minutes. But, you know, as soon as you start reacting, you then put your own agenda on the back burner. You don't do the things that you want to do. You get more stressed, so on and so forth. So what Greg McKeon says is that almost everything is noise. Almost everything is noise. The old idea about 80-20, that 20% of our activity produces 80% of our results, may not apply anymore. It may be something like 1090 or 595 in the sense that, you know, 5% of our activity produces 95% of our results. Therefore, the rest, 95% of our activity, is simply noise. And this is the problem. This is the challenge that we face as entrepreneurs is that we hang on to that remaining 95% because it makes us feel secure. I get this, I, I know friends, entrepreneur friends, and I feel it as well, who say something like this. You know, um, I want to build a business where I can set and forget. I can build some kind of asset, whether it's an email newsletter or affiliate marketing or property investment. And then I can walk away and forget it. And, you know, I can just look after it a few hours a week, a few hours a month, but it keeps growing in the background. It makes money whilst I sleep. That's the dream. However, when the dream becomes reality, the problem is that they're so used to being busy all the time that once those couple of hours are done with, then they look for other things to keep them busy. And that's the kind of mindset that we're stuck with, that non-essentialist mindset that we've been trained with you know when you go to school what they teach us at school is to write like a 10,000 or whatever it is now 20,000 word essay you have to write at least 10,000 words now what is that this is the system which we've been trained in you can't go in and deliver an essay with a thousand words you'll get penalized but what if you could deliver all that value and more in that time in less words? You know, if you could deliver it in a thousand words, you're saving time for the examiner and the reader. But you get penalized for that. You have to produce 10,000 words. And it's the same when you work in a shop or in an office, you get paid for the time, not the results. And that is how we've been trained for the first 20 years of our life. And we don't get to practice trade-offs. And this is what essentialism is about. It's about trade-offs. We can't have it all. There has to be a trade-off. And this is the phrase. It isn't actually mentioned in the book, but I think it summarizes the book very well. Say no to grow. Now, as an entrepreneur, as a business person, you've probably been indoctrinated with this idea of saying yes to everything. Say yes. Say yes to every opportunity. Pursue every customer. Take every deal, etc. However, you know, when you actually grow, and I found this with my business, I was saying yes to everything, and it reaches a plateau, which is quite a stressful place to be in. You, you want to know how you can grow from that place. How do I get to the next level? You can't work harder. You can't sleep less. You can't hire more people. The only way to get to the next level, to break through the situation you're in, is to say no. And that may be counterintuitive to you. You may be expecting the answer to be to work harder, work smarter. It isn't. It's to say no. You've got to jettison the stuff in your life that isn't essential. And almost everything isn't essential. And this applies to meetings, people, projects, clients, everything. You may feel you're losing out in the short term, but in the long term, 
you'll grow because every no leaves a space for a yes, a bigger yes in the long term. So let's talk about the three ways mentioned in this book which you can say no, that Greg McKeon talks about in Essentialism. The first one is the perks of being unavailable. And if you've read the four-hour work week, Tim Ferriss does a lot about talking about protecting your time because time is the asset. And he says, this is Tim Ferriss now, he says it's better to build a reputation for being difficult than it is to be a yes man who's also a flaker. What you don't want to do is say yes to everything and then let people down. And more importantly, you you let yourself down. You know, you you commit to all these things and you can't make it and then you beat yourself up. Why did I do that? You know, now I look stupid or, you know, I said I was going to do this and I didn't do that. It's just easier to say no. And to let people know, just be honest up front. Look, no. Seth Godin, one of my favorite authors, says, don't go to meetings, don't watch TV and do something that scares you every day. I think that's a fantastic application of saying no. So second, second application of how to say no, how to execute the trade-offs, so to speak, that Greg McKeon talks about in Essentialism. The second part is borrowed from Derek Sivers, who um, wrote a great book called Anything You Want, And in this book, Derek Sivers says, whenever you get new information, like a new project request, a new opportunity, a meeting, an idea, whatever it is, something that's on your table, in your mental inbox, and you're wondering about it, you've got all these things. And, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you've probably got a big mental inbox with a lot of ideas in there, which in itself occupies a lot of time Just being there, you have to reserve that space. It's like a storage space in your head. And you have to kind of keep coming back to it and say, oh, you remember that idea where I was going to set up that business, you know, importing, you know, stuffed animals from China? Uh, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. And what you have is you have a whole bunch of these ideas that just sort of sitting there, not being dealt with. And these are meetings and people as well. And Derek Sivers says, it's either hell yeah, or nothing. That's the decision. Hell yeah, or nothing. If it's anywhere in between, it's a nothing. It's a no. Look, if it doesn't make your heart beat faster, don't do it. So think about that meeting. Think about that project. Think about that new business idea. Does it make your heart beat faster? Now, why do I say that? Because you can't cheat your heart. Your heart reacts. When you get scared or frightened or excited or in love, your heart beats faster. There is no way of cheating that. It tells you your internal emotional reaction to a stimulus. And it can't be faked. And in the same way, when you look at this information, you're going to get an internal reaction which cuts through all the bullshit. And the bullshit being all the kind of like the noise, the non-essential stuff. You're going to get this essential reaction. Is this what really connects with what I want to do in my core. It's hell yeah or nothing. The last application of making a trade-off, becoming an essentialism, is the idea of uncommitting. Now, we tend to commit, we tend to overcommit as entrepreneurs. And that can be a dangerous game. The key is to commit to nothing except absolutely what's essential. And I know Tim Ferriss talks about this. You know, don't commit to anything until people really bug you. You know, people are really twisting your arm for something. Then it's worth it. You know, your natural reaction to every meeting, every opportunity is to be no. And you might think, well, then I bat away all the opportunities and nothing comes my way. Well except the ones that make your heart beat faster, right? Because you know when it's right to say yes. McKeon talks about the endowment effect. Now, this is something that psychologists have researched and studied to really 
be a psychological phenomena which changes our behavior for the worst. It works against us. The endowment effect is this. Um, the, an economist, also a writer called Daniel Kahneman, found that if you gave people coffee mugs and then you asked the owners of those coffee mugs, how much would they be willing to sell those coffee mugs for? And then you ask normal people who didn't have a coffee mug how much they'd be willing to buy that coffee mug for. Well, there's a big difference between what the owners thought their coffee mug was worth and what the buyers thought that coffee mug was worth. Now, so that's actually some numbers behind this. Kahneman found that owners would sell their coffee mugs for about $6. Whereas a non-owner would buy it for half that, $3, actually less, $2.50. So there's a big difference in value between owning something and buying something. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's the perception of value. So once you have something, what Kahneman found and what McKeon is telling us is that we want to hold on to that thing more than actually that thing is worth to us. How can that apply? How can that apply in business, in life, and so on? Well, Tim Ferriss talks about this. He, he, so an example he gives, a, a really good example of the endowment effect, is you go to a movie, you sit in the movie theater, and you're watching the movie, and the movie's crap. What do you do? You're a third of the way through the movie. Most people would say, well, I've paid, I'm here. I'm going to sit to the end and watch the rest of this crap movie. Because I'm here, you know, I've already paid. Waste of time, waste of money. Whereas what Tim Ferriss says is, you know, if he's halfway or a third of the way through the movie and it's crap, he gets up and leaves. Because he's not allowing himself to be controlled by that endowment effect, which makes us a non-essentialist. We end up doing something to appease the fear of loss rather than something that's actually valuable to us, right? Now, I've seen this. I've seen this in real estate property investment. I used to go to uh, private uh, property owners, owner occupiers. So they lived in the property and they're interested in selling their property. And they wanted to do it without going through a realtor or a, a real estate agent. And I found that in almost all cases, almost all cases, the owner of the house thought that their house was t worth 10% more than their neighbors. In almost all cases, they had a reason. Yeah, we've got a better kitchen, we have an extension, we've got a better garden, we're, you know, our house is in better condition. All cases, 10% more. That was the owner premium. But when you looked at the numbers, it wasn't the case. In most cases, their house is worth the same, if not less, than their neighbors. But they thought it was worth more because they were emotionally attached to it. So how does the endowment effect affect us as entrepreneurs and business people? Well, the first one is uh, financial freedom, financial independence. Endow the endowment effect effectively works against us in achieving financial independence. So the essentialist would ask, you know, what do I need to do to become financially independent? The non-essentialist would do everything. And a core part of that doing everything is buying things that they don't need, which is obvious. But, you know, let's apply that to assets. An essentialist would buy assets that go up and rent assets that go down in value. Now, that sounds like economic sense, but think about how people are in the real world, people buy cars. Now, a car never goes up in value, except for very exceptional circumstances like collector's cars, but that's, you know, less than 1% of the market. Most people buy cars. Even worse, people borrow money to buy a car. And, you know, once they have the car, they're attached to it. They think it's worth more than it really is. And it's just a money suck. Whereas what you should do is rent a car. 
if possible, always rent a car because then you avoid the endowment effect. And it's the same for houses as well. You know, I own several million dollars worth of real estate property, but I rent where I live. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But think about it in terms of the endowment effect. The reason I own property is for an investment because I know over the long term it goes up in value. However, I know that the house that I live in is not an investment. And that's the problem that a lot of people have. They think that the house that they live in becomes an investment. It's not. You know, they start doing things like, you know, decorate the kitchen, putting extension on the house and so on, wasting all this money. And it go back to like the owners of the house. They think it's more valuable than it really is. You know, if you want to get rich in property, don't own a house. Don't live in a house that you own, I should say. Own houses, but rent. That gives you ultimate flexibility as well. It's the same with business as well. You know, the essentialist approach to business, avoiding the endowment effect, is to avoid fixed commitments. So office leases, hiring staff. What the essentially what the essentialist would do is stay lean as possible for as long as possible. So that's the summary of the book Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less by Greg McKeon. And I talk about lean at the end of the book. And of the five books that I review in my free book course, Lean's a key theme. We've got the Lean Startup, the $100 Startup, and so on. Uh, you know, staying lean, not just about talking about it, there are actually methods and techniques to build lean businesses. It's quite an established science now. So go and check out the book review course, which is free. You can go and sign up there, save time and money. I'll do the book reviews for you and give you the key lessons from each of those books. And as I said, at the top of the the show, I talked about the, the other books that this essentialism book borrows from, 80-20, The One Thing by Gary Keller, The 4-Hour Work Week, and The 7 Habits of Highly Effective People. All of those thoroughly recommended. Hopefully you enjoyed this review of essentialism by Greg McKeown. If you liked the review, then please leave a comment. If it's on YouTube, leave a comment under the video. If you're watching this on upschoolbookreviews.com, leave a comment under the post. If you're listening to this on iTunes, hey, then why not leave a review on iTunes and let me know what you think. More book reviews every week, upschoolbookreviews.com.